Okay, welcome to the fourth lecture of EE 503, fourth lecture. So what we have done last time, last time we have defined inner product. So what is the inner product? I am assuming that I have vectors x and y. These are abstract vectors, but in your mind you can consider them as vectors in n dimensions. So this inner product is mapping these two vectors to a real number. But this mapping is satisfying some axioms, as you see over here, inner product axioms. So let's assume that I have a valid inner product satisfying these axioms. Then I'm defining a norm. So this is just a definition. This is given. So this is norm induced by the inner product, this inner product, defined like this. If this is indeed a norm, it has to satisfy the axioms for the norm. So last time we have checked that, this is rather easily verified that this is true whenever the inner product axioms are true. And also this is true whenever this inner product axioms are true. So only this one, the second one, called triangle inequality, is left to verify that this, all of these three norm axioms are satisfied. So before checking this norm uh, triangle inequality, or consistency of this norm axioms, with this norm definition. So we need to introduce another important concept. This is called Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So we need to prove the following. Cauchy-Schwarz. So we need to, let me write inequality. Show that x and y inner product is less than or equal to magnitude of x times magnitude of y, or norm of x and norm of y. Okay. So I should be verifying this for x and inequality, sorry, for all x and y vectors. Again, as I have said, you may, in your mind, take them as usual vectors in n-dimensional space or in three-dimensional space. But these are abstract quantities right now, satisfying these axioms. So I want to show them this is true. So this proof is simple and it is important for us. So this is the reason that I would like to mention this. So let's assume that I have an inner product in this form. So lambda is just a scalar, it's a real number, everything is real valued, let's say. Then how can I express this? Well, if I check this, there will be a term, and there will be a term, I will explain this a little further, and there is a term like this, am I right? So what's going on? So as I have said, this is an inner product. Keep this fixed. Then x is operating on this one. And lambda times y is operating on this one. Since this is linear, linearity property or axiom of the inner product, so I can separate them. So this is the superposition of two components. x operated on this. So then I have x and x somewhere. Then x and lambda times y, but lambda because of the linearity, lambda goes out. And because of the symmetry properties, lambda can be put over here or over there. It always goes out of this inner product calculation. So I have x times this, x inner product y. There's a scaling lambda, it goes out. Lambda y inner product x, then lambda again goes out. I have, I got this term. Then I have the inner product of this and that. Lambda goes out twice and I have this. Okay, so this is greater than or equal to zero, sorry, greater than or equal to zero because of actually this axiom, inner product axiom number four. Let's say axiom number four for inner products for x and y, okay? Because this is the same vector, if I take the inner product of the individually identical vectors, then I get something non-negative. 
So what do I see? I see something like this. A lambda square B lambda plus C. So what do I mean by this? This is equal to A. This part is equal to this and C is equal to this. Okay. I have this. So for a fixed x and y vectors, I can calculate this ABC quantities. Now this is a second degree polynomial. So let me write this. Note that this is something like this. P lambda second degree polynomial in lambda. And what do I know that right now? P lambda is greater than or equal to zero. So what's the meaning of this? Then I can write the following. Since P lambda is greater than equal to zero for all lambda, well, I can select any lambda that I like, then this polynomial, let me write it over here, should have a discriminant b squared minus 4ac. Do you remember this? Polynomial, this is the discriminant that we use to find the roots of this polynomial. Then this should be equal to less than or equal to zero. Okay? So this is the discriminant. Okay. So if I process with this, what is b? 4 b is 2 times this. There is well, okay, there's square over here. Less than or equal to 4 times, I move this, a times c. But a times c is, let me move it a little. I have this. Because, as you can see, this is my definition, norm x square. This is my definition, induced norm definition. That's you see over here, induced norm definition. So from this point on, if I take the square root, I immediately get this Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Magnitude less than, and we are done. Well, so what we have used? We have used axiom number four. And from this axiom number four, I have got a polynomial. This polynomial has, well, it's either, it's a second degree polynomial, it has either no roots, real roots, as you see, everything is real valued right now, or, well, it has a repeated root, okay? This is the case when discriminant is equal to zero. Now, let's proceed a little bit further. Maybe I can erase these axioms for now. Also this part. So let me examine case of equality. Okay. So what is the case of equality for Cauchy-Schwarz? Schwartz. So this is the case. Magnitude, well this is equal to magnitude of x, magnitude of y. Okay. So if this, now we are working in this way. If there, I have an equality over here, then take the square of this, I have an equality over there. Then that means that I have a real valued root that means the following. If I have an equality, then there exists, let's say, a lambda x such that, sorry, let me say it like this, then discriminant is equal to zero. Then this implies that there exists a lambda x value such that this polynomial evaluated at lambda x is equal to zero. Okay. Actually, this is the root. This is the root of p lambda. I mean, something 
actually very trivial because this is the lambda for which I have this equality so discriminant is equal to zero so what does that mean then p lambda x is equal to zero but p lambda x is equal to I have this so this is x plus lambda x y x plus that special lambda lambda x y so I get this point x plus lambda x y magnitude square or norm square I should say this is as you see the definition of the norm is equal to zero so what do I have over here now from this norm if norm is equal to zero then the argument the vector has to be equal to zero argument of the norm this vector has to be equal to zero so what do I see I see the following x is equal to lambda x times y so this is the equality condition for Cauchy-Schwarz so what do I see verbally we can see that x vector and y vector are along the same direction because lambda is just a scalar so lambda can be 1, 2, 5, minus 1 if it's minus 1 it's flipped to the other side but they're along the same direction okay so that is the Cauchy-Schwarz proof so this is a very significant result so once we cover this so let me erase the proof we can say things, interesting things okay so this is the result that we have proved then Cauchy-Schwarz states that I have an inner product then divided by the product of the norms is less than or equal to 1 I can write this like minus 1 and 1 okay well this is the same as you see this is the Cauchy-Schwarz that we have proved remove this absolute first divide by this then this is in magnitude less than 1 so I have in value less than um, 1 and greater than minus 1 okay so what can I say now I will define the following I will say that this quantity I will define as cosine theta as this so this can be a definition okay because any number in between 1 and minus 1 can be associated with a cosine theta as you see 180 degrees of theta will be minus 1 0 degrees of theta will be 1 and so on cosine 90 degrees will be so on and we will interpret this like angle between x vector and y vector but as I have said this is totally abstract well this is just a mathematical fact this part is a mathematical fact so I'm artificially generating maybe an angle interpretation but if we go back to our usual geometry well usual 3D geometry or 2D let me write 2 slash 3D geometry 3, let me say dimensional geometry so for that one I have x and y defined as let's say in two dimensions x1, x2 this is y1, y2 then this inner product is defined as x1, x2, y1, y2 okay so this is one of the forms of the inner product satisfying the axioms that we have said now how about this 
Well, let me write remember. Let me have okay a vector x. Let me have a vector y. So how about this vector? This vector is y minus y minus x. Because if I add x vector with y minus x, I get this y vector. Okay. So let's say that this is our origin. Okay. So this can be a two-dimensional or fifty-dimensional example and so on. So in a two-dimensional case, this forms a triangle that we know very well. So let me call this theta in the usual geometry. So the question is, well, if this side has norm x, this side has norm y, this vector, this is the length of, let's say, this side of the triangle and so on. So the question is, what's the length of this side? Well, the length of that side is, or let me write the question, the length of the side shown with blue color is obviously this is y minus x. Okay, so how about this? Then y minus x square is equal to y minus x y minus x because I have defined an inner product for this inner product using the Euclidean distances I can write such things then if you do this I get this again a similar calculation am I right? So I have four terms, as you see, two terms over here, two terms over here, individually operated. Two terms are summed up, I get this one, third, and the fourth term are present over here. But Cauchy-Schwarz now, or this cosine definition now tells me that y minus x this is y square minus 2 xy x square but this is also equal to this so I have Instead of this one, inner product, I have written this definition. Inner product is equal to vectors cosine theta times the product of the norms. Cosine theta times the product of the norms. So is this familiar to you? Is this one familiar to you? Well, this is the famous cosine theorem. Cosine theorem in 2D geometry. 3D geometry or 50D geometry, it doesn't matter because as you see this comes from this inner product definitions. So when theta is equal to 90 degrees, if these vectors are orthogonal to each other that you remember from you know everywhere from high school and so on, then this becomes Pythagoras theorem because the, far, the, the hypotenuse at that time is equal to the sum of the hypotenuse square is equal to sum of the sides length square. Okay, so this is cosine theorem, something that we are familiar. What else?
So let me write some cases. For example, theta is equal to 90 degrees in this case. Now, you can say that this is x vector, this is y vector. This is the angle between these two vectors. So this is the picture. But this 90 degrees. So this is my theta. Okay. So from this picture, this verbal picture, sometimes it is written as this, two vectors are orthogonal. Instead of this picture, you may have this symbol. But for our purposes, that corresponds to this. X and Y, when they are orthogonal, their inner product is equal to zero. Well, the reason is, inner product is, again, this part, cosine 90 degrees is equal to zero. Okay. So, as you see, we are approaching the problem from two ways. Sometimes I define this inner product and interpret this as a you know, abstract angle. But in the physical 3D, 2D world, because I have lots of intuition about this, about triangles, circles, and so on, angles, sometimes I interpret this as indirectly as an angle, then I say that their inner product is equal to zero. So I'm approaching from the other side this time. So how about this two? Theta is equal to zero. So what does that mean? So that means that x is, well, parallel with y, something like that. So what do I have? x is equal to alpha times y. Okay. But this alpha is a positive quantity. The reason it's a positive quantity is they're in the same direction. So the angle between them is equal to zero. Theta is equal to zero. So it will be clear when theta is 180 degrees. So this is, let's say, y. This is x. Now, this is 180 degrees. And for this case, x is equal to, let's say, um, beta times y, but this time beta is a negative number. Okay. And remember, these are the equality cases for Cauchy-Schwarz. Okay. Because, as you see, these are the equality cases for Cauchy-Schwarz, and these are their verbal description, uh, not verbal, but, you know, uh, pictorial descriptions of these equality cases. Okay. Very good. So, what was our goal? So, let's remember, our goal was trying to prove this triangle inequality, actually. Okay, this is good. We have learned something about the angles between the vectors. But let me work a little bit further. And oh. Okay. So let's let's say finally prove that triangle inequality is indeed satisfied by this induced norm. So, induced norm, as you see. So, what's triangle inequality? So, triangle inequality is this. So, let me write. triangle equality. So this is proof. So how can I prove this? Now, I will write this again, x plus y, x plus y, less than, we are doing almost the same. Very similar calculation. This is 
an equality. Now this will be an inequality. So from here to there, I apply Cauchy-Schwarz. Okay. So this is actually this case. Angle is equal to zero in between these two vectors. So their inner product is, I have this. Now, if you check this, this is norm of x plus norm of y parentheses square. If you check this one, this is x plus y norm square and we are done. Okay x plus y norm square is x plus y parenthesis square. So indeed, after taking square roots, I have this. I don't need to take the magnitudes because everything is positive. So this is positive. I'm adding two positive numbers. So magnitude doesn't do any work over here as you see. So uh, I don't put the magnitudes, so I get this result immediately. So what we have seen conclusion, induced norm is induced norm from an inner product, from, sorry, an inner product is indeed a norm because it satisfies all the axioms. Now, what kind of picture do I have? So we have actually quite, uh, we have learned quite a lot of things. So we have learned, for example, let me have a sketch like this. So let me have So there is a vector space definition. Again, you define vectors in an abstract way, but then you define an operation, for example, polynomials. Well, you can say polynomials, uh, second degree polynomials form a vector space under real uh, valued operations like multiplication by a real scalar and addition operation in the usual real valued uh, number sense. Then if you have two polynomials at the top, you get another polynomial. You have zero polynomial as the identity element under this, and so on. So this is called the vector spaces. Vector spaces can be defined in an abstract way. Some of, for some of these vector spaces, we may define metric. And for some of these metric spaces, we have norm definition, as we have seen, norm space. And for some of these, we may have inner product spaces. So inner product spaces, so this is the most natural one to us because we have the concept of angles. As you see, if I can define an inner product, I automatically have a norm, I automatically have a metric, and so on, okay? But not all norm spaces have an inner product, not all metric spaces have a norm, etc. So this is the picture that we have, okay? So from this, inner product definition, there is an induced norm, from induced norm, there is an induced metric, and so on. So this is the picture that we have in mind. Since this angle concept is very useful in terms of interpretation and drawing and explanation, and it also works very well, as, as you will see, uh, these inner product spaces are very important for our purposes. But this is the general picture that we have. For example, uh, in some other spaces, you may not be able to define an inner product like this, but you can define some linear functionals and so on. It becomes more complicated. 
So there is a dual space, linear functionals, interaction of those linear functionals and the vectors and so on. For the inner products, it's very simple because, well, if I have a vector 1, vector 2, they all come from the same space, okay? So they belong to the same space and so on. Okay. Now, very good. I am quite happy with this. Now we are done with this, all of these, but do you remember we were discussion, discussing projection matrices? So we should go back to this discussion. Now after so many words, maybe we can finish this projection matrix discussion. Let me see. Okay. Okay. A1, A2, AK are vectors in Rn. So they are n-dimensional vectors. Then B is also a vector in Rn. Okay? Let's assume they are all real values. So what was the projection operation? Let's remember. So this, well, diagonal shape, it corresponds to span of this k vectors. Okay. So what's the projection operation? Projection operation maps b, this arbitrary vector b, to the closest, let's say, point on the, let's say, constraint set. But for our purposes, constraint set is just, you know, this is span of A1, AK. Okay? So, how can I express this? You know, what can I do about this one? So let me have a candidate point over here. Let me mark this with blue. So this is a candidate point, B hat, B1 hat. So B1 hat is in this span. So let me write B1 hat is then a linear combination of A's, these A vectors. So what's this? So A is a n by k matrix. This is k by 1 vector. That is, I have A1, A2. So these are all n-dimensional vectors. And I have k of them in the columns of this A matrix. Now I have also x1, x2, xk. And as we did before, this is a linear combination of xk, ak. A linear combination of these vectors. So the question is, among these linear combinations, I need a vector, or maybe there's a multiple solution, I don't know, such that this is at the closest distance. So how can I find this? Well, do you remember, previously we have said something about, you know, angles and so on. So let me have this. So let's assume that I have a special one, B star. So my claim is the following. Previously we have done this kind of, you know, discussion. If this B star is, you know, this element is 
If it is indeed the closest one to the B, so this distance is minimum, then this B star should have this error vector so this is B minus B star so this error vector should be orthogonal to the all elements of this space for example it should be orthogonal to this it should be orthogonal to this one and so on so our example was this if I am projecting a three-dimensional all of tip of this board marker to this board so probably it's just you know it's just this one and all other points so this is the error this error vector is orthogonal to all of these you know uh, orthogonal to the plane okay that is it well this, that was our reasoning and we have discussed why that is so by you know Pythagorean triangle and so on but right now I'm introducing this angle concept so we are coming from geometry viewpoint one more time so if that is the case now first of all what can I say now let's assume there is a B star like that then after this this is critical reasoning B minus B star should be orthogonal to do you agree well all of those points but it should be orthogonal to at least A1 I guess am I right because A1 is one of those points A2 is other one so it should be orthogonal to A1, A2, AK so I can write this to B minus B star it should be orthogonal to A2 now I have K1 also B minus B star should be orthogonal to AK okay but how can I write this orthogonality condition I can write this like this let me check this okay so this is A1 or let me write this, sorry let me write it first like this as an inner product and AK inner product B minus B star this should be equal to zero I have of course all others a2 b minus b star is equal to zero okay so please let's pay attention this b1 is a linear combination of these so my b minus b star vector should be also orthogonal to this one but how about this if it is orthogonal to a1 a2 ak and since this inner product is linear so that means that I can multiply the first one by x1 the second equality by x2 third equality by x3 last one by xk sum them up use this linearity and I can show that obviously they are also equal the error if it's equal uh, if it's orthogonal to all of these k vectors then it's all also orthogonal to the span of these vectors essentially this is due to the linearity of this inner product okay now so then I should be again I'm continuing with this one so this equality so let me write them okay one a1 b minus b star is equal to zero that means that I have an equation like this b minus b star is equal to zero and I have k of these again a k b minus b star is equal to zero I have k of these equations do you agree so still I'm not sure whether there will be a solution or not but if there is a solution then I know that that solution satisfies this equation 
that equation and all of the other equations in between 1 and k. Okay? That is it. So this is very nice because actually there are infinitely many points over here, as you can see. Okay? It's uncountably infinite. Okay? You cannot even count them because you know, it's like associated with real numbers. But at the end I get only k equations. If I can satisfy those k equations by a point, element of this span, I am done. I am sure about that. So how about this? Then let me write all of these equations together. So this is a matrix. Okay, let me write it as before. Okay, so this is a matrix. First row of this matrix is this vector. This is a row vector. This row vector times this column vector is equal to zero. First equation. Second row, first column is equal to zero. Let me make a zero over here. Last row, AK, transpose. So remember, all vectors with underbar are column vectors. But if I take the transpose, they become like a row vector. So this row vector multiplied by this column vector is an inner product. So that inner product is also equal to zero. But how about this? This is my famous A matrix, A matrix transpose. Okay? Times B minus this special B is equal to the zero vector. This is vector zero. Well, this is the same. And this is this. Okay. So what do I see from here? Now instead of k scalar equations, these are all scalar, there is a scalar over here. I have a one matrix equation in this form. Okay. Very nice. Still, I don't know whether there will be a solution or not, but B star. So how can I express this B star? Still, I have no information, but I know that this is an element of element of this space. So now I'm defining this. So let me put x star if you wish. That special x. So b star is supposed to be in this range space of this A matrix or in the span of the A vectors. Then it should be expressed like this. Then if I insert this, I get this equation. So I insert it over here, A transpose A x star, move to the side, is equal to A transpose B. Okay. So if there is a solution for this, I am done. So is there a solution for this equation system? That is the issue. Now there are two cases. A transpose A is invertible, then case number one, X star is equal to A transpose A inverse A transpose B. Okay? So what is this X star? X star is the linear combination weights to get this one. For example, this can be 5 times AK. 2 times A2, 1 times A1, then the linear combination weight is 1 for this one, 2 for this one, 5 for this one, and so on. Okay? So that vector contains that information. Okay, X star. Then, so I get the unique solution. If this matrix is invertible, if that is the case, then 
I get the solution like this. So the question is whether this is invertible or not. That's another problem, but let's also find this B star. Then the optimal point B star is A times X star I get this. Well, good news. Now I have a mapping. Let me call this PA. So this is projection matrix. Good news. We are there. Projection matrix to range space of A. Okay. So this will be our projection matrix. So I will, we have right now managed to find a matrix mapping this point to this point. So if I, let's use this color because it's an important occasion for us. So this is the projection matrix A mapping B to this B star. Okay, that is it. So now I have managed to find this projection matrix in terms of A. Okay, so we will continue after a mini break and that will be it.